uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just first want to check that you can hear me. Yes, even at the back. Uh, okay, that's great. So welcome, everybody, uh, to this evening's talk, and, us, and especially, of course, big welcome to the speaker, Alistair Campbell, whose train was cancelled this morning, so <laughs> uh, it was a rather stressful day all round. But anyway, Alistair's here, and he's smiling, despite being on a crowded train. Uh, so... Uh, Obviously, I am relieved and pleased to see him and pleased to see all of you. Um, Alistair Campbell, of course, is a very well-known figure. Alistair is probably best known to most people for his life in politics, for being Tony Blair's, uh, initially his campaign director, later uh, his press secretary, his director of communications, and Tony Blair described him as a genius. Uh, we can revisit that after the talk. Uh, but obviously, Alistair has great skills uh, as a strategist and as a communicator. And I uh, experienced those communication skills today when he was updating me <laughs> on his train journey and uh, uh, where it was pausing. So um, Alistair, is an, uh, because of his enormous skills, he's an advisor to governments all around the world in, for their strategies. He's also the, also the editor at large for the new European newspaper. He had uh, a career before he went into politics as a journalist. And he seems to have had a brief career uh, as a roulette, uh, what's, what do you call it, setter up? Dealer. A dealer. <laughs> okay, a roulette dealer. And maybe that gave him a taste for risk. Um, he also has a wonderful podcast, which I'm sure that many of you listen to. It's the most popular political plod podcast in the UK and listened to by people all around the world. It's him. Alistair uh, and Rory Stewart, different sides of the political spectrum, uh, and they uh, agree to disagree agreeably. Don't quite always manage it, I would say, uh, but if you don't listen to it, I can strongly uh, recommend it. But politics is not what Alistair is here to talk to us about tonight. There's an other side uh, to Alistair's life which is concerned was mental health. And he's been a great campaigner uh, for changing how we approach mental health. Um, he, as well as being a campaigner, he has personal experience uh, in that and, and he's written many books and his latest book, uh, Live Better, uh, is something that perhaps we should all be trying to do. Alistair has received many awards. I won't go into them. There are just a couple that I'll mention. Uh, he's an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, an honor for his work on mental health. He's a global, global ambassador uh, for mental health. And of interest to this society is that he was given a global medal of honor, honorary patronage by the Philosophical Society at Trinity College, Dublin. Mm. So, uh, you probably didn't even know that, but I knew that. <laughs> uh, Alistair's interested in football, won't talk about Burnley. Uh, he's interested in and loves cold water swimming. He loves the bagpipes, and we might get a little treat on that score later. Um, and he hates the House of Lords. <laughs> So he's, uh, <laughs> as we say in Scotland, he's a man of many pets. But we're going to hear about Alistair's personal journey tonight. And so I'll hand over to him uh, to tell us about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Um, yeah, I have to tell you that these governments around the world that I advise, the UK government is not among them. Um, I mean, you said I wasn't going to talk about politics, but you provoked me. Um, no, I'll tell you that the first, listen, thank you very much for being here, especially when it's pretty cold out there. Uh, and so you've all come out to hear me blather on when you could be watching football on television. Indeed, I could be watching football on television, uh, but I am here. And I have, as Pat said, had a bit of a nightmare journey, but anyway, we've we've made it. And, and um, it's, it's, I've got a lot of connections with this place, with this university. Two of them rooted in my family and one in a very close friendship. So my father, Donald, he was born almost exactly 100 years ago, uh, the son of a crofter on the island of Tyree, and he became a vet, uh, and he was educated here at Glasgow University Veterinary College. And my brother, also called Donald, he was the eldest, he was a security officer at this university, but more importantly to him, and I think to the university, he was the principal's official piper. And he was employed by the university for almost three decades. And sadly, it's closed at the moment. But if you go to the bottom of the stairs coming down from where the fancy stuff goes on at View Hall, there's a very nice portrait there of my brother. So the next time you're passing, just have a look and say hello uh, to Donald. And the friendship that I mentioned was with somebody you will have heard of, you will know, and that is Charles Kennedy, who's story and connection with this university, both as a graduate and as a former rector, I'm sure many of you know very, very well. All three, sadly, now dead. All three, though, do continue to play an important part in my life. And Charles and Donald in particular are fundamental to the theme of my speech, which, as Pat says, is about the need to change the lens through which we view mental health and mental illness. Now, keeping it in the family, when my mother died, she left this package of papers in which was a poem that she asked us to put on the back of the order of service. And the last line was, those you love don't go away, they walk beside you every day. And when I walk, which I do quite a lot with my dog, I often have little chats with departed friends and family. Among them, Charles Kennedy. So I might say to Charles, Charles, quite a lot has happened since you left. All right, such as? Well, there are only 14 Liberal Democrat MPs. Oh dear, is Nick Flex still in charge? No, he is now Mark Zuckerberg's right-hand man. What, the Facebook guy? Dearly me. Yes, Charles, Nick is a very, very wealthy man now. And who's the leader of the Labour Party? Ed Miliband stepped down not long before I died. Well, first it was Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn? Nobody could roll an R quite as expressively as Charles. He says, next you'll be telling me Theresa May and Boris Johnson went on to be a prime minister. Well, funny you should say that, Charles. No, 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 you're not, you're not serious. Well, the thing is, Charles, David Cameron, he called a referendum, he lost it, Theresa May became Prime Minister on the back of it, then Boris Johnson screwed her over, he became Prime Minister, and since then, you don't want to know, you don't want to know. But anyway, he says about this referendum, so Scotland's independent, is it? I said, no, Charles, it was a referendum on Europe, we've got this new word now that everybody's talking about all the time, and it's a complete and total catastrophe called Brexit. That's terrible. I'm assuming the rest of the world's in better shape, says Charles. Well, sadly, no, it's not. Now, Charles had two great qualities that I value perhaps above all any others in politics and indeed in life. He had moral courage and he had wit. And he knew the value of wit. I'll give you one of my favorite Charles Kennedy quotes. I'm a big fan of Puccini. Tosca is great. It's got the lot. Murder politics, sex, intrigue. It's like the commons, but with good music. 
and he appreciated the wit of others. And he had some wonderful stories of life on the campaign trail up in the Highlands. My favorite of which was a woman on whose door he knocked to be told, I'm sorry, dear, can you come back later? I'm blow drying the cat. Now, it was, it was funny to watch all the Vox Pops, the interviews with the people in Fort William on the day that Charles died, because virtually everyone who was interviewed said, oh, yes, I love Charles. I always voted for Charles. And I remember thinking, it's absolutely incredible that he lost that election, isn't it? Because they all voted for him. But he would have seen, he would have seen the funny side of that as well, because there was a lot of pain in his defeat but there was no bitterness. I never once either heard him express bitterness at his ousting as leader of the Liberal Democrats because he knew deep down that his colleagues had a point. They knew, and he knew they knew, that unless he cracked his drinking, a bigger problem was coming their way. And when he died, there were many people who said that had it not been for Charles's drinking, he could have been a truly great politician. But to me, that was like saying Churchill could have been even greater had it not been for his black dog and his tendency to drown it in scotch. Abraham, Abraham Lincoln could have been even greater had it not been for his melancholia. Clinton could have been a near perfect presidential, had a perfect presidential reputation had he not had such a Kennedy-esque sex drive. That is J.F. Kennedy, not Charles Kennedy. So Charles was respected because of the political qualities that saw him rise so young and so far. But I think Charles was one of those politicians who was loved because people sensed his vulnerability and through that, his humanity. And one of the things I want to say tonight, we have to learn to understand and accept that alcoholism is a disease, not a lifestyle choice. Now, of course, every time we raise a glass, that is a choice that we make. But nobody chooses to have a disease. Some get it, some don't. Charles got it badly. That's why he's not here now, why we miss him, and why we miss his voice in the debate on the direction of our country. And for me, though I don't do God, when drink does take somebody, I do have a very strong sense of their, but for the grace of God, go I. Anyone who's ever had a troubled relationship with alcohol knows that this is the way you must think of it. It is a relationship, including not drinking. That is a relationship with alcohol too. I'm not sure that once Charles's drinking starts to become a problem, and I think for both drinker and friends, it's almost impossible to know when exactly that happens. I'm not sure he ever really got on top of that relationship. He did go for periods without drink. He did have short periods of rehab to get dried out. But if this disease is in you, willpower alone, let alone other people telling you it's obvious what you need to do, just don't drink, will not fix it. You need to find a new way of looking at the world and living your life. And that can be a lot harder if your life is in the public eye, every move you make subject to analysis and often attack. And when I was in hospital, not far from here, post a psychotic breakdown in the mid 1980s, I was led by a wonderful psychiatrist from Paisley by the name of Ernest Benny to the insight that unless I resolved to stop drinking, I would likely be back in such places again and again. And though I was in the intense pain that follows a breakdown and heading for a depression that would stay with me for a long time, something clicked in me and I knew that my life had to change. Also, back then I was in journalism, as Pat said, not politics. So when I got back to work, I felt I could be completely open about my problems. And even in the macho, hard drinking world of Fleet Street, most colleagues were absolutely brilliant. I think Charles felt that if he'd admitted to a possible problem when on the rise, he might never have reached the top. And though there is actually a lot more kindness in politics than sometimes people might realize, it wasn't unreasonable to worry about what his colleagues would say and do, how the media would respond and whether it would unleash a 
torrent of coverage that would hurt his family, and of course, how his constituents would react. Scotland, I think it's fair to say, has as a country a somewhat troubled relationship with alcohol. And that relationship notion, I think, does apply to countries as well as to people. But there's also a strand of Scottish opinion that deeply disapproves of alcohol and might not have been overly sympathetic. Certainly, so he thought. Also, I used to wonder, could he actually do the things he was going to need to do to be able to say genuinely that he'd sorted out his relationship with booze? Too many of our conversations around that time were laced with the little tales and the little tactics that I knew so well from my own days of heavy drinking. Not had a drink today so far, half past 11. I barely touched it at the weekend. Did fine. Did you see me on TV last night? I did fine. Feeling okay. I'm feeling okay. And it's the opposite. This is the really strange thing. It seems to me that it's the opposite to what people do when a relationship with a partner is going wrong. When that's happening, we can only see the bad side, not the person that we fell in love with. When alcohol is the partner, you only see the good side. And you look for the bits that tell you everything's actually fine, everything's okay, and you don't need to worry. And that, I think, is what happened with Charles, even when the evidence to the contrary is staring you in the face every time you look in the mirror or every time you stare at the bottom of a glass. Now, I did get Charles to agree to go to a place I know in the Scottish borders, a place called Castle Cray. And we go every New Year, we go up to a place in Fort William, in Ardgau, near Fort William, Charles's constituency, and Charles would come and spend some time with us. And he admitted he was going through a very, very bad patch. And I told him about this place, and he said that he was up for it. But by the time I went back to him with dates and rates, he had other things to deal with, reasons to put it off. He had a sick father he wanted to help. He had an important speech to make. He had a meeting here at the university. He had a planning meeting for the next election. Whatever it might be, there was always a reason. And so it went on. But Charles was in my, my phone, and, and it's, I don't know about you, but I can't delete dead people in my phone. He's still in my phone as, as Charles K. And I'm sitting there at my desk, one day, and I got a text from Charles Kay saying that he died. And could I call on this phone to speak to Carol? Carol MacDonald was his friend and his partner. She'd been worried about him after speaking to him on the phone. She'd driven up to see him, and she found him dead. And she phoned around family and so forth, and then she phoned me, and she said, I know you would have wanted to know before it started to leak out. And I think I knew why. She wanted me to know. Yes, because I'm quite good at communication to help with the announcement, which I did. But also, I think Charles wanted me to be among the first to know that his relationship with alcohol had ended. It was over. And he would want me to use that to keep my own relationship with alcohol on the straight and narrow. So when I've got that poem of my mother's in my mind, and you're walking along and the people you've lost are there, Charles is often there along with others that I've known who've fallen victim to this evil disease. And he'll be urging me, push the urge aside. He'll also be urging me to keep heading up to the most beautiful place on earth, which is the Scottish Highlands, where now he rests in a little cemetery at Clunes, where Fiona and I make an annual pilgrimage and I play on the pipes the lament that was played at his funeral. But his memory also pushes me on to campaign for change, to fight for a new relationship between our culture and alcohol, one which has to be led by politicians' understanding that unless we face up to the damage being wreaked across families and communities, wrecking our National Health Service, filling our courts and prisons, then there'll be many, many more Charles Kennedys to come. Not so well known, not so talented, but victims like him of a disease that all too often we fail to see as one. And it's not enough for politicians to say, as they do, as indeed, you may have heard of Matt Hancock of late. Matt Hancock once introduced me to a conference on mental health, 
said some very nice things about the changes that I was campaigning for. And he said, isn't it great that we're all talking about mental health more than we used to? And I said, no, to be honest, I'm fed up of talking about it. But unless we do keep talking about it, we don't get the change that we know that we need. Because my worry is the services that we need to match the demand simply aren't there. And I sometimes worry that governments use these awareness and anti-stigma campaigns, welcome though they are, as a substitute for, rather than an accompaniment to, the services that we need. So on stigma, I think we're going forwards. On services in many parts of the UK, I fear we're going backwards. Now, the reason I knew about this place, Castle Craig, near Peebles, and felt that it would be right for Charles, was because it was where my son Callum sorted out his troubled relationship with alcohol. And AA regular, he's not touched drink now for almost 10 years. But I often wonder what we would have done if we'd not been able to pay, as many alcoholics and their families simply cannot. Now, Castle Cray is a place where mainly British alcoholics are treated with mainly Dutch drug addicts. And the latter are there, sent at public expense by a government which understands not just that addiction is an illness, but that long-term savings can be made for the state if we invest in treating it as such, even for the hardest cases. Some will relapse when they go back to the Netherlands, but many do not. And when those that don't are able to rebuild their lives, become healthy, productive citizens again, we all gain from that. And I wish that our governments could be as enlightened as they are. So now, my brother, Donald. He was another who died too young. He was just 62. And in the eulogy I gave at his funeral, I thanked this university specifically. And I want to tell you why. Because at his farewell party, which wasn't far from here, it was over in the library, just over a year before he died, he was retiring early because of his breathing problems. He announced proudly that as the official piper to the university, among the students he piped out at graduations, he said, I've done 7,200 doctors. And I said, yeah, and you've seen quite a few of them since. Because Donald had schizophrenia and he had plenty of crisis periods in his life where he needed medical help and often in some of the hospitals around here. But the reason I singled out Glasgow University for praise, and it's one of the reasons I readily accepted Pat's invitation to speak today, is because at this university, he was never seen as a schizophrenic. He was seen as an employee who had schizophrenia. And there is a big, big difference. He didn't define himself by his illness and nor did the university. His work was incredibly important to his well-being. He loved being in a team in the security department, wandering around telling students to take their feet off the desks. He loved the status that went with his position of being the official piper at the university. He liked ritual, he liked performing, he liked being something, and above all, he loved his music. For the last time, this is one of these strange wheels and wheels things in life. The very last time that Donald played the pipes was alongside me at Charles Kennedy's memorial service in this very university. Donald didn't look well. He was struggling for breath even before we started. And I said to him, listen, I can do this on my own. And he said, no, I'll do it. I like Charlie. We came down, we led the procession into the quadrangle, but a third of the way round, he had to stop to fight for breath, and I finished alone. And he never played again. And to lose his work, and then his piping, to physical ill health, after doing so well for so long with his mental ill health, felt pretty cruel. But one of Donald's psychiatrists once said this to me. He said, Donald is my greatest success story. He holds down his job. 
He owns his own flat. He drives his own car. He has a passion for his music. He has more friends than you and I do. And he has a positive attitude almost all of the time. And that last bit was certainly true. He would sometimes say, you know what? I got given a bit of a rough deal, but you've got to make the best of it. And it helped that, especially latterly, he did do God, and his faith was certainly a comfort. And I just want to say a few words about schizophrenia. It is a truly horrible illness. But there are no crutches, there are no bandages, there are no scars. It's invisible. It is literally all in the mind. People who have it are often pariahs, shunned in the workplace, derided and abused on the streets. And because of the stigma, it's at the wrong end of the queue for research, so that those on a lifetime of the kind of antipsychotic drugs that Donald took live on average 20 years less than the rest of us. So our dad, Donald, was 82 when he died. My brother, Donald, was 62. Bang on the average. Now imagine if we knew that the drugs we take for asthma or for diabetes shortened our life by 20 years rather than kept us alive for longer. Do you really think we would accept that? Or do you think we might actually find the capacity to move with the speed we moved to find a COVID vaccine and find better treatments and cures? As well as my own experience of mental ill health and that of friends and family, the other reason I do feel that my campaigns and communication background is useful in this area is because language is so important. And a couple of pleas about language. First one, please never use the phrase commit suicide when we talk about someone who ends their own life, which is the ultimate in mental ill health. We commit sins and crimes. That's where the phrase came from. It is neither sin nor now a crime. So I wish we'd stop referring to it as such. And let's stop referring to schizophrenia as a split personality. It's an awful cliche. It's as awful as the way that people use the word schizophrenic when they mean there are two views of something, when somebody has a good mood and then a bad mood, or when your football team plays well in the first half and badly in the second half which I'm sure most of you hope will happen to England on Saturday. It, there was no, no rebuttal of that, was there? <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but I'm with you. Um, schizophrenia is a severe illness in which the workings of the mind become separated from the reality around you. And it can be utterly terrifying. Imagine a cacophony of voices in your head telling you to do things that you normally know you shouldn't do. Then imagine plugs and light switches, road signs and shop signs talking to you. Imagine sitting in a pub or on a train and thinking that every single word being said and thought by everyone around you is about you. Then imagine snakes coming out of the floor and cats charging through the ceilings. Donald had all that and more when he was in crisis. Often, this happens a lot with people with severe mental illness, when he felt good and he thought he could wean himself off the medication. That's when he'd tend to go into crisis. But imagine the strength of character it takes to deal with all that in a way that had so many people love him so much, not out of sympathy, because he didn't want sympathy, but out of an appreciation of the real him unclouded by illness. Also to have had that and never say it's not fair. I said it. I said it a lot for more than 40 years. From the first day my dad and I saw Donald lying in a military psychiatric hospital, absolutely terrified, and his eyes not the eyes that we knew. Not fair. Why him? I said it. I said it a lot. He never did. Not then, not ever, not once. Imagine being so keen to be in the Scots Guards, doing well, but then with this illness, career terminated, the prestige he had of playing in the Scots Guards 1st Battalion Pipe Band gone, never said a single word against the army. Just ended badly and got through it, got on with it, adapted and tried to live the best life he could. 
resilience, fortitude, courage, kindness, not letting even a horrible illness destroy zest for life and love of people, and always looking for the positives. So he and Charles, and people who shared their struggles, they're the reason I campaigned to change the lens on the way we think, talk, and act in relation to mental health. To campaign to eradicate discrimination, to end the inequality of access, which means that only a fraction of those who would benefit from talking therapy actually get it. To deliver on maximum waiting times, which exist in theory, but particularly right now, are not being met. And yet so few of us shout and scream in the way we do about cancer or a and &E. To end the disincentives in the system, which mean mental health is the service most likely to be cut in times of austerity. To make the words in the NHS constitution that there should be parity between physical and mental health actually mean something. To stop people being shunted around the country for treatment. To stop mentally ill kids being locked up in police cells because through no fault of their own, the police have become the mental health front line. To accept that prisons are filled with people who will be better off in hospital than in jail. To ask ourselves why mental illness is a research desert compared with physical illness. To urge the governments to invest more in mental health today as a way of saving money tomorrow. To develop a preventative mental health service, not as we have now, a mental illness service. So stretched that a sick man, woman or child has to be an absolute crisis before urgency is applied. But also, if I can move to the final argument about how we can change the lens, not just to speak up for the mentally ill as people who need support, but to speak up for the mentally ill as often major contributors to our life and times. Anything I've achieved in my career, I do not feel that I've done so, as a Daily Telegraph journalist once put it, despite a history of mental ill health, but because of it. The resilience that comes from building back from breakdown, the ability to deal with setback, a thick skin. You'll see that when the questions come. Loyalty to others who've been close to me and who stayed loyal to me. The energy and creativity that comes from emerging from a depressive episode. And I genuinely believe that if it had not been for my breakdown and the insight it gave me and the, the ongoing depression after that, I would not have been able to do the job that I did for the Labour Party for as long as I did it with the energy and the commitment I had nor take on all the things I do now. And why I say that is because of the yardstick that the breakdown gave me for pressure. I still get depressive episodes. I still get anxiety. I still get very stressed. But I find a quiet space and I say to myself, if the breakdown was nine out of 10 bad, how bad is this? I get perspective. Now I'm not recommending psychotic breakdowns in the middle of Hamilton for all. But I am saying that sometimes it's too simplistic to think of mental illness only in terms of the suffering and the pain. I honestly think mine made me what I am. And I'm proud to talk about it because I'm proud that I learned from it and use it to this day. And get good out of bad is one of my rules of life. And to me, the most dreaded place on earth is the comfort zone. My least favorite word is content. My mother was a very content person, and there is nothing wrong with that. It was all she ever wanted, to be happy in her life, which she was, and to care for her family and for others, which she did. And she would often ask me, why do you put yourself under so much pressure? And the answer is, and she would shake her head as I gave it, that pressure can create physical, emotional, psychological change, which helps focus, sharpens the mind, gives greater energy to the body, and improves performance at whatever it is you're trying to do. And my mother would say, you're absolutely balmy. Now, when King Lear was on at the National Theatre in London, I did a talk there 
on power and madness with a guy called Namia Nasia Gamey, who is a professor of psychiatry in Boston in the United States. And he said, normal people are naturally conformist. They go through education and career paths in which the goal is often to be liked and to achieve according to the norms of a previous generation. Parents who want to keep them safe and secure. Teachers who want to get them through standard exams. And he believes, Gamey, that this normality obsession discourages the development of skills that are needed to excel. And that great achievement, he says, requires something beyond the normal. And he argues further that innovation and creativity are explicitly a reflection of mania. He suggests there are four main features of mania. Increased rapid thought, increased physical and mental activity, increased likelihood of risk-taking, roulette dealer in me, increased confidence and self-esteem. And when taken to excess, as I know, those characteristics can be dangerous and potentially even deathly. But there can be enormous advantage in them when the mania is more or less under control. Because by definition, increased rapid thought and increased activity enable you to work harder, get more done. So provided the work is good and the decisions are okay, this should in theory lead to more success and achievement. Now, there's a guy you may have heard, may have heard of, this is Sir David Brailsford, cycling genius, transformed British cycling, won the Tour de France, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when I asked him once what other walk of life he learned most from, he said, psychiatry, no doubt about it. And he described his hiring of a psychiatrist by the name of Steve Peters as the single most important, the single most important act of innovation I ever did. Definitely an innovation, not just a marginal gain. And he said this, there is definitely a link between hyperachievement and being a slightly or even seriously unbalanced personality. When Brailsford came across Peters, Peters was dealing with psychopath psychopathic personalities at Rampton High Security Psychiatric Hospital. I realized, he said, that a lot of the things he knew applied to our, right, our riders. I'm not saying they're all psychopaths, he said, but what makes them special is that their minds don't work in the same way as most people's. They are extreme, extreme ambition, extreme talent, extreme drive and ego. But there are risks with that, risks to them as individuals and to the team. They can be strong, but they're also vulnerable. And Steve, he said, Steve Peters, was brilliant at making the strong side stronger and the vulnerable side less vulnerable. Now to move from sport, to politics. Who is the greatest political figure of our lifetime? And if I did a survey of that, a show of hands, I think many of you would say, and I would, Nelson Mandela. For much of his life, he was labelled an extremist, not least by the UK government of the day. He certainly had an extreme mindset. Is it normal to be able to endure 27 years in jail and come out smiling and full of forgiveness? Is it normal to be able to cope with the torture of knowing you may never see your family again, and what's more, that they're being abused and hounded outside while you're inside? That's extreme. Who usually wins surveys on questions about who is the greatest Britain or the greatest ever prime minister? I might like the answer to be Tony Blair, but it's Winston Churchill. Who is the American president that all American contenders, apart from the narcissist and chief Donald Trump, feel they have to lord as the greatest ever president? Abraham Lincoln. Both were depressives, in Churchill's case of the manic variety. Charles Darwin, Florence Nightingale, Marie Curie, all had what doctors today would define as mental illness. Now just imagine a world in which those five had never been able to fulfill 
their potential because their mental frailties have been viewed as overwhelming obstacles. It would be a very different place. They were all massive change makers and their influence is still with us today. Florence Nightingale single-handedly reinvented the basic concept of healthcare as well as challenging the idea that women could not be medical professionals. But she had a personality that today would be described as bipolar. And Nasagami has written a book in which he sets out what he sees as a strong link between depression and realism, which can contribute to leadership skills required in times of challenge and difficulty. The thing about crisis, he says, is that the depressive imagines the worst and works to avoid it. The optimist believes they can handle the crisis and that everything will turn out fine. So when Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was pursuing a policy of appeasement, Churchill was constantly warning him about the danger of Hitler and the need for a stronger riposte. It was a steady message through the premierships of Macdonald, Baldwin and Chamberlain. Now were, Gamey asked the question, were his depressive instincts making him more realistic about the threat that Germany posed and Chamberlain's optimism binding him, blinding him to reality? He did say the same, I should add, about George W. Bush and Tony Blair, both non-depressive optimists with regard to Iraq, but that is something perhaps I shall address another day. Now, Lincoln, his law partner, William Herndon is one of my favorite opening lines in any book that's ever been written of the thousands about Lincoln. It starts with, melancholy dripped from him with every step that he took. But he also said, Lincoln had an inner strength, as tough and gnarled as seasoned hickory wood, and the increasing hostility that his outspoken politics provoked as the country drifted into war seemed to bounce off him like peas from a pea shooter against a wall. That, I would argue, is resilience through depression. Gamey believes that Martin Luther King, and he wins all the surveys about what was the greatest speech that was ever delivered, even though none of us can ever remember anything apart from the first line about the dream. He said that he became a great leader, not despite being a manic depressive, but in his view, because of it. The mania, he argued, gave him energy and high self-esteem, which contributed to his charisma, which is important in any campaign leader. And it made him forward thinking, which is important in strategy. His depressive side outweighed the manic side often, and the qualities associated with depression, particularly the understanding of human emotional pain, allowed him to be an exceptional, empathetic, team laid leader. Now, it's not unusual for anxiety to go hand in hand with depression. Charles Darwin, and here is an extraordinary fact. Charles Darwin was born on exactly the same day as Abraham Lincoln, February the 12th, 1809. That was quite a day for the world. Charles Darwin had chronic panic attacks that often left him, if he had to speak in public, in floods of tears, palpitations, skin inflammation, agoraphobia, blinding headaches, and agonizing stomach cramps. And over 25 years, he consulted more than 20 doctors in a vain bid to find a cure. But Darwin's illnesses accompanied this restless intellect that couldn't accept the status quo, and that was constantly asking the question, what if? So the reason it's important to understand all this is that a lot of the stigma that's still attached to anything that smacks of abnormal mental activity, that's what drives it. And that means that so many more organizations, in my view, are missing out on having potential and using the full potential in their midst. And it's really strange this, because sport is leading the way, business is second, and politics is third, when it should, given the scale of the state of the world, it should be the other way around. Just think about it. Clearly, the demands in sport are predominantly physical, and yet it's now seen as absolutely routine for top sportsmen and women to have proper psychological and psychiatric support. 
In politics and business, by contrast, where the challenges are much more mental than physical, no such attitude change has taken place. It's still considered to be an admission of weakness, even to suggest that you yourself are suffering any kind of mental strain. Yet the stress under which political and business leaders work, the hours, the volume of decisions, the nature of issues they have to deal with, the shocks and setbacks, the abuse, the time spent separated from family, it'd be far better to acknowledge the potential negative psychological impact of that and try to do something about it. And most leaders just plow on. So that is odd that most top athletes will have proper support, but politicians operating under massive pressure think they can do without it. And sadly, as regards the politician of whom I've spoken most this evening, Charles will never really know if he might have benefited from such support. So there you go. I hope I may have persuaded some of you to get involved in campaigning on this because it's through campaigning that we can make change and it's needed more than ever because the campaign has gone forward and I worry it's now going back. But I do honestly hope that one day before I'm gone, we can look back and we can wonder, did we really used to accept medications that took 20 years off people's lives? Did we really used to think that the mentally ill were more likely to be violent than the general population when the truth is they are more likely to be victims of violence than the general population? Did we really think it was okay to discriminate on the workplace on the grounds of someone admitting to a mental health problem, past or present, as still happens all too often today? And I actually, I call for a bit of reverse discrimination in this area. I speak to a lot of businesses, and the best of those businesses are filling the gap left by government because they know that if they look after the mental health and well-being of their employees, they'll be a better firm. And I argue to them, if you have two identical CVs in front of you, same level of school qualifications, same degree, same sorts of interests, both done the gap year thing and the interning and the volunteering, but one's got six months that went a bit missing. And they admit it was because they had a breakdown or they're in rehab even though they were in prison, whatever it might be. And I always say, go for that one. What are we looking for in people that we employ? Honesty and resilience. They're the qualities that we get from somebody who's able to put that down there and not feel imprisoned by that stigma themselves. So join in, campaign for change, and one day, hopefully, we will have that parity between mental and physical health that today exists in the words of the National Health Service Constitution, but not in the practice of government or of the reality of healthcare. And only in my view, if we can genuinely say there is parity between physical and mental health, only then can we really say we are a genuinely civilized country. Thank you very much for listening. I understand that some of you like to get a bus home now. And I have to have a two minute pause to allow those who want to get a bus home to get their bus home. And then I'll come back and take questions from those who don't want to get a bus home. I'm not going to be offended by anybody who wants to get the bus home. However, you will miss at the end me playing the lament that I mentioned on the pipes. And I might even play something a bit happier so that we don't all go home crying so thanks for listening for now bus bus people leave and we're back in two minutes thank you <coughs> okay, ready for the yeah 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 okay uh <clears throat> thank you we'll now start uh the q a session just before we do that i should have told you about the fire escapes <laughs> One out there and one out there and one out at the back, but it's a bit late in the day. I uh, guess that, you know. So, uh, questions for Alison? Raise your hand. There's a man with a microphone rushing towards you. Yes, sir. 
Good evening. Hello. Um, I believe the Scottish Government was one of the first to introduce minimum pricing for alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's liable to have any influence on alcoholism? And if you do think it's going to be successful, should it be more widely adopted by other governments? First of all, I want to welcome this gentleman back because as he went out, he told me that he wasn't going for a bus, he was going for a pee. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, welcome back. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I, I, I'm, uh, even though I was rather inconveniently expelled from the Labour Party for voting in the Devon European elections, I'm still 100% Labour. And some of my Labour friends were a bit peed off with me when I very volubly supported what the SNP government was trying to do. Because there is, you know, a lot of the people here connected to the university believe in data, believe in research. There is so much research showing that there is a link between pricing and consumption. Um, and what's more, that this idea, yes, of course, if you're better off, you are more likely to withstand the economic pain, but actually it does force you to change habit as well. So it's, all, it's a cultural as well as a health thing. And we were just talking a minute ago about the, if you think about this, this is just to understand how change can come, provided governments take a lead and do stuff. So take smoking. If this was us 25 years ago, I could be standing up here and the chances are I might be smoking. The chances are a good quarter of you might be smoking now and we'd all be breathing it in. Right? There's not a single person who came here tonight who even thought about lighting up a cigarette once they walked through the door. Do you know why that happened? Because one government decided to give it a go. And do you know what that government was? Ireland. The Irish government. And we followed and then others followed. And now, you know, you still go to some countries. I was in Turkey recently and honestly, it was horrible. Horrible going to a restaurant, people at the next table smoking, because it was, and it's such a shock. Now, so that I'm saying that you, ha you have to take those steps to make change. And, you know, all the, uh, and of course, these lobbies, the alcohol lobbies are so powerful, you know? So they, they are into governments. The, the, the chances of the current government in Westminster doing it, zilch, absolutely zero. They're completely owned, lock, stock, and barrel by all these big corporate vested interests. So I think it would have an impact. Wouldn't be the only thing. You'd have to have a lot of other stuff going, but definitely worth doing. So, uh, who's choosing the questions? Me. Yeah. You, you are, right. <laughs> um, right. Just, just before okay, you, okay. just before the question, can I just check that the people at the back can hear Alistair or do I need to get him back here? You can, you can hear him okay? Yeah, okay, great. Oh. What was that? Yeah, no. I, I didn't notice that they were quite young, those hands that went up. <laughs> okay, maybe if you... Should I stand here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I can do the question, don't we? Okay, you... Yes, okay. sir. Okay, um, yeah. I'm one of about a dozen psychiatrists I can spot in this audience, but um, what, what's your take on, you know, have we have overextended the idea of mental health and mental well-being, and, and does it detract from people with the severer illnesses, like your brother? I, I grew up with a mother who had schizophrenia, and and the, the problem is that is a real discontinuity from everyday mental health. I, I could not understand what was going on in my mother's mind, you know, no. thinking Bible John was at the door and mm. hearing voices. So I, I, I think there are everyday mental health problems, yeah. and then there are things that are kind of off the scale, discontinuity, and can't be explained by everyday feelings um, so the, the campaign for mental health can maybe dilute our response to those with the severe yeah. problems. How, yeah. how do we strike the balance? Um, I think through I think through the the normalisation of the discussion about it. So look, I always have. If you look at the charity sector, for example, you've got charities that just deal with depression. You've got mind, which kind of goes right across the, the, the piece. And you've got something like rethink, which is very, very focused on psychosis and schizophrenia. And what I would define as the very serious mental illnesses. But I think that if you, th you know, I've never had cancer. Okay. So I don't know what that is like. I've had a bad knee. And I know that that's on an illness scale. I'm kind of over here and the cancer's over here. 
And I think likewise, if we can have that same level of normalization around the debate about mental health, and I want to think about his mental health, not mental illness, then I think we can, we can deal with that. And actually it would help us, I think, if we had that preventative service that I'm talking about, where the people down here starting to feel a bit odd, a bit of anxiety, a bit of low mood, whatever it might be, if they can get some sort of understanding and encouragement, it means you can put way more resources into the stuff over here. So I totally take the point, and I can see where you're coming from, but I, I think actually destigmatizing will we'll deal with that. Yeah. Gentlemen there? I want some women. And when I say I want some women, I mean, uh, I mean, I am away from home, but I didn't mean that at all. I meant, but after this, I want a woman. So you have to do with me at the moment. I'm afraid another psychiatrist. I, I think it's, it's important to stress that alcoholism is not a lifestyle choice. I agree with that. But the juxtaposition of lifestyle choice with illness is interesting because illness, on the other hand, is suggesting that it's something that just happens to us. And there's a lot of awareness now, and Gabor Matty is a big name out there, for example, in terms of understanding alcoholism as a response to something. And yeah. trauma is the word that's often used. Yeah. And that is suggesting it's not just an illness that happens to us, but we can think about it as a response to circumstances and engage with the circumstances. And clearly you did that in your own life very clearly. So there was some choice that you were able to activate yeah. and connect to a sense of agency. Yeah. So that juxtaposition can leave us with a sense, if it's not a lifestyle choice, it's an illness, which can make it difficult to look in that broader way. At, well, I'm going to take a note of that. And I'm going to rewrite the speech for the next time and deliver it. I think that's quite a good point, actually. I think I think maybe it's because I was talking about Charles. I think with Charles, I did feel he kind of had it in him. I felt there's something there that, but I completely get your point about the trauma. I think that people get get driven to a point where they're seeking solace in some kind of addiction, whether it's drink, whether it's drugs, whether it's gambling, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, I, I actually I completely agree with that point. Just that I didn't make it myself. Thank you. Right, where's my woman? Okay, I'll ask you a question. No, 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 I want a different woman. Well, no, I can ask this question because I hadn't met Alistair till tonight and he thought I was a man before he met me. Now you know. <laughs> uh, no, Alistair, I would, just would like to ask you about one of the things you said at the very beginning about Scotland mm -hmm. having a complex relationship with mm. alcohol. And one might think that that tends sometimes to be a feature of Northern nations, Finland, Norway, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, why? Is it the cold? Well, uh, or it might be the dark. It might be the dark. I mean, I think the other thing to remember about when you look at the, the data on drinking, um, if you if you just go through, I, I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but if you actually remove the fact that there are, you know, s several million people now in the UK who either for reasons of choice or religion are teetotal, never touching alcohol, right? So when you see these figures about average alcohol consumption, it's higher than we think because you've got to take that out. And I do think, I, look, I, my dad was from the Hebrides, as I said, and I saw that very, very big cultural divide. A lot of people who didn't drink at all, and those who drank, who drank incredibly heavily. Um, and that creates all sort of, uh, of difficulties and divisions within, within a, a community. But I do think that, I think the Northern, the, the Nordic thing is probably related to climate and to light and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Now, there's a lady who's not Pat right at the back. She might be Pat, but I don't know. <laughs> Hi. Uh, um, hi, I'm a secondary school teacher um, and we had identified, I think a couple of years ago, a lack of resilience in, in school children, which has obviously got much worse over the last few years. Um, and I was taken by the things you said about mental health building resilience, whereas one of the problems we seem to have is lack of resilience mm -hmm. escalating mental health. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Um, how old are your kids? Secondary school, do you say? Yeah, okay. Well, the first thing you do, you go back to school and you say, this resilient stuff, Alistair Campbell's got a book coming out in June, <laughs> right? And it's called, But What Can I Do? 
and how we're all how young people got to take over and change the world and a lot of it's about the resilience you need to do that um no I, I i think you're right and and i think there's i think there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that we think we understand but i'm not convinced that we do so for example we talk about anxiety this sort of seems to be this kind of epidemic of anxiety particularly amongst young women suicide now the biggest killer of young men and we we've we've persuaded ourselves and it may be right that social media is a massive problem here that may be right i don't know but we've persuaded ourselves that's right and i think all we've done in doing that is give ourselves a kind of a kind of excuse and especially my generation i think we can sort of give it that excuse of saying well it's something we don't really understand but we had things that our parents didn't know we had to kind of get on deal with now they're having to do that but actually i think what we're doing is underestimating deeper reasons why it is proving so hard to be resilient and the single most obvious one is poverty i actually think that the climate crisis is having a terrible effect on when you think about it, i'm 65 right i'm probably gonna live out another 20, 20 years or whatever right it, the world's probably not going to end in that time but you know once you start thinking a bit longer term you really do start to feel that kind of existential threat so i think i think we're not i think we're giving ourselves a superficial analysis of what's happened to these kids um but i think i look can you teach somebody to be resilient you can certainly teach people about resilience and i think we should think about about doing that with kids we do it with our own kids so I don't know, I presume the Scottish, I mean, none of the curriculum change, change, but, you know, I've, every time I see Michael Gove, when he was education secretary wrecking the schools, um, I would always say, you know, you, we've got to, kids have got to become more resilient. Can we teach, is there anything we can teach to do that? I think we can. We have some oh, oh, uh, Pat. Right. Okay, we have an online question from Dallas Carter. Was it a mistake to close most psychiatric hospitals in the 1990s in favour of care in the community? And should we be replacing the bed for lost, even if not in separate hospitals? Uh, well, I think it was, when I was a journalist then, and Mrs. Thatcher was the Prime Minister, and I, I can't pretend that I ever found it very easy to give her the benefit of the doubt. Um, I think there was a... I think there was I think there was good motivation within it, but also possibly a bit of bad motivation as well. I think it's um, I think the good motivation was the feeling that these were institutions a bit like our prisons that were built a very, very long time ago. And, do you know, by the way, do you know where the phrase round the bend comes from? You know, my mother, when she said I was barmy, she used to say sometimes I was round the bend as well. And round the bend was a planning thing is that the asylums were always were put where people couldn't see them around the bend, out of sight, out of mind. So that was that was kind of, and that was a good, to sort of say, you know, we're not shutting them off into places that we don't recognize as being part of society, that's bad. The problem was that the, the much vaunted care in the community wasn't really there. So if you, it's like at the moment, going back to the question about the, the impact that these our campaigns might have, the one, I'll tell you one genuine worry I have, is that we're making people think, mm, yeah, maybe I've got a problem. Maybe I should think about that. Maybe I should go and get help. Then when they go and find the help isn't there, chances are you feel worse, you feel more isolated. And so I think we're in a similar position there. So I think care in the community, great idea, great idea, provided the care is there. Uh, and I think it became an excuse for basically for families to have to pick up most of the pieces. Uh, Pat, am I allowed to call a question or do you want to do something? Gentle days. He said his hand right from the word go. Thank you very much, Arthur, for an excellent talk. But this is actually the second time I have read and now listened to your talk because by accident today I went in to check up in your CV on the web and found your speech. Well, I put it there. I, I, I did ask. And I really permission. enjoyed it. Good. Good. I enjoyed it better when you spoke it. However, my question is... Is that a compliment or not? Uh, Come on out. You could, you could have a wee bit of advice. You could have put up a couple of slides 
with the, the four steps we need to use in the lens to change this lens and the names of the five people. Okay. Because unless you made mental notes as I did in a piece of paper, and I may I will relook at your speech. However, the question is Right, I'm gonna take that on board. Yeah. So slides. I always say power PowerPoint corrupts, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Slides and what was your other one? Pictures. Well, the, the, oh, no, I'll give you the criticism later. I'm not doing okay. Public right, thank thing. you. Yeah. The in your speech, you did say we should not use the term committed suicide. Mm -hmm. What term should we use? Because my my nephew, at the age of about in his early forties, trained as a vet, was very successful as a vet, committed suicide on a Sunday night after a very good Friday meeting with the rest of his family, who are both his two daughters, two sisters, one's a GP and the other is a GP, GP who trained as a psychiatrist. Mm. Yet this lad committed suicide. What should we say? What did he do? He, end, he ended his life by suicide. He oh, killed himself. It's not, it's not the committed, it's he just should have ended, he ended his life by suicide. Yeah, or he, or he, killed, he ended his own life. He took his own life. He killed himself. It's the commit. Commit underlines the fact that it was a crime. Uh, you know, you commit burglary, you commit murder, you commit manslaughter, or you commit a sin. Now, there may be some parts of the church that still think suicide is a sin. Uh, but so, no, calling it suicide is fine. Um, um, you know, I, I, and listen, these things are it's not a big it's not a huge thing but it's sort of i know people who've been affected by suicide who survived suicide and they feel it um so i th i think it's it's and, and the, you know I, and i do think language is so important in this in this field it's how you make change uh so, yes hello hi um in your view, what should services for people with schizophrenia look like? I spent a great deal of my life working with people with schizophrenia mm -hmm. as a psychologist and attempting to properly implement community care against all the odds. <laughs> the, 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 the question was what, what Sorry, should I'm services not... for people with schizophrenia look what like? What should they really look like yeah. in your view now? Um, Listen, I've got to be honest, when, I mean, when, 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 my, when my brother died, my sister and I, we, we drew this, we would do this map in, around the UK of all the places he'd been in hospital, okay? Um, and some of them were really, really, really good, really good. Some of them less so. But I think that one of the reasons he settled here was actually because he had all the things that you need to be able to support what he was trying to do with his own illness. I mentioned the job, and I know that's not possible for everyone, but it's possible for a lot. Family was incredibly important to him. And again, for a lot of people, that's not possible, but he had that as well. He had a very, very, very good relationship with a very, very good GP. Um, and I think that the, a lot of GPs are terrific, um, but I think that when it comes to serious mental illness, you need you do need to keep up to date with what's going on but but ultimately he had that he had that relationship and he also had that's the reason i mentioned the university he had this ability he had the he had the knowledge that if he became ill it was not it was not going to lose him his job um so i think it's a comp it's, it's so sort of, it's the layers of support in the community i think now you could a lot of people can't have those because some people they get kicked out of the family um or they get you know because of the, they do something they end up in prison they get they get ostracized so uh, but i think if you have all those layers and then of course the other thing you do need uh, the, the other thing i really do wish that you had was medication that didn't have the awful side effects and and, and didn't take years off your life um so all of that is still a horrible illness and it's always going to be a horrible illness but i think that could at least alleviate it <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just a point of information. We know that there's more um, depression the further north you go in the world, and that there's more schizophrenia the further south you go. But also in terms of alcohol, um, the next lecture in this series is about Robert Burns, 
who wrote in one of his letters to a friend, I think in Edinburgh, about drinking a bottle of port to cure his hangover. So there's a connection again between, you know, alcohol and culture and, and creativity. That's the hair. That's the hair of the dog, though, isn't it? Yeah, the, the very, very, very black dog. <laughs> yeah. Very so, large dog as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I was wondering, uh, there's also a, a relationship between uh, alcohol and behaviour mm -hmm. in Scotland and the further north you go in the world, but the further into Europe you go, there's not that relationship, for example, in France, there isn't the relationship between alcohol and bad behaviour, domestic abuse and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what kind of solutions you would offer for that. Bloody hell. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think it is, about, I'll tell you what I think it is, this cultural thing about Britain. Um, I think we're way too tolerant of it. I think we're way too tolerant of antisocial behaviour. Um, if you, I think that, right, so for example, this football match on, on Saturday, France, England. Um, I, I've, I've got a house in France, I spent a lot of time in France, and you're absolutely right. You, you can see, you can go to, you can see people in French bars who might be having too much to drink, but they don't seem to want to, they don't seem to feel that it gives them the right then to kind of be imposing themselves on the entire community. It's almost like we give people permission to be a complete pain in the ass if they've had too much to drink. We don't like challenging them. Um, and if you, I'll tell you what I think it's about. I think we've, and I do think this is a marketing thing. I think the alcohol culture has managed to persuade us that it's impossible to have a good time unless it's related to drinking. If you're, and, and, and you can't fail or succeed. So you watch how, how the, this World Cup thing, you watch how many of the commentators say, well, Bill McCown used to, didn't he say, you know, they'd be dancing in the streets, right? But they, they talk about it, you know, and we'll, be, we'll all be celebrating with a drink tonight. Well, why? It's a cultural thing. And I think it's a culture, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of research done on the, <clears throat> the power of marketing and advertising. There's a reason why companies spend millions and millions and millions on advertising, because it works. So we ban smoking advertising, or we ban smoking sponsorship, and that's another of the reasons why we've changed the culture on it. And I think until we do the same, until we break that link between, you use the word behavior, we have a culture where any aspect of behavior is covered by alcohol. Somebody dies, oh, sad, have a drink. Baby's born, wet the baby's head. You know, it's, and you're right, the French, the Germans, Germans I think used to do it quite a lot, I don't think they do it now. Didn't really answer the question about what you do, but right, it's definitely not a woman, that's a man. Oh, there's a woman with a red coat there, uh, yeah. I yes, have, sir. Thanks. Uh, just to say, first of all, I was at Charles's memorial where you and your brother played, and it oh. was uh, it was a real honour. So thank you very Did much. Did the pipes sound okay? They sounded wonderful. Yeah, good. Um, That's the main thing. My question was about the challenge that you're setting to us and the way forward. You've talked about how the stigma in society regarding mental health has improved, but in the workplace, you alluded to things like the Equality Act that protect people. But do you think there needs to be further legislative change to move things forward? I'm not sure it doesn't. I don't, I'm not sure it does need more legislation, to be honest. Um, I think it needs leadership. I think it needs legislation that exists for people to be aware of it. But it also it needs leadership, particularly in the in the business world. And to be fair, a lot of the businesses are now doing it. I was at um, an event during lockdown. I did an all, an all staff event for the Bank of Ireland in Dublin, 3,000 people on it. And the woman, the, the new CEO, a woman called Francesca McDonough, she opened the meeting by saying, we've asked Alice to speak today because we've learned a lot about you guys, the staff during the lockdown. And from this day forward, our strategic priority as a company is changing. The number one strategic priority of our company from for the bank from today on was is the mental health and well-being of the staff. Because if we don't get that right, we're not going to fix the other stuff. 
And I was like, wow, I've never heard that before from a big employer. So I've now used that. I go around, and, and it's interesting, the banks, the financial sector is way ahead of a lot of the others. And I think the reason twofold, one, nearly all of them had suicides during the crash. And two, they know every time that happened, it cost them a lot of money. They've got to go and get new talent and, and what have you. So they thought we've got to do something. And they are doing stuff. So I think it, I, I don't think that needs legislation. I think it needs leadership. Okay, I think we'll take one one more question from the lady in, the lady in red. Yeah. Um, uh, just uh, thank you I for your to talk this right. evening. I'm just thinking maybe a wee bit about uh, Charles Kennedy and then uh, drinking culture. Do you think that the drinking culture and the number of bars and the Houses of Parliament uh, has uh, is it any better as in this you know it's less frequented any comments on past or present practice and availability well funny the gentleman who gave you the microphone said made that exact same point when we were talking down here um i mean it's it's bonkers it's absolutely bonkers it's a workplace and it, at a time when the sort of public respect or lack of for parliament is so so high disrespect is such an obvious thing to do just don't have them if you want to go to the you're at work if you want to go to the i mean okay you need places you need meeting places but have meeting rooms you want the paint you, you can still see the paintings and the nice architects all there but it's just an absurdity it's an absolute absurdity and when i worked there when i was a journalist um and that was when i was drinking was I, I'll tell you what I did. This is back to the cultural point. I persuaded myself that going to the bar was work. I did, I did. I persuaded myself that going to the bar was work. Just as in the last couple of weeks, I persuaded myself that sitting on the sofa watching four football matches a day, as long as my laptop's on my lap, right, is working from home, right? Uh, I've done a lot of working from home the last few weeks. Um, and it's oh, good to, even asking the question is mad, it's absolutely mad, and it just encourages that. I, I think I've got to say, I think I think politicians drink less than they did because when I was a journalist, you could, you could watch politicians bouncing off the walls, right? Seriously, you'd watch them bouncing off the going to vote, and there was a kind of unspoken thing, we didn't really write about it much. Whereas today, somebody get the phone out, be on social media straight away. So the, I think the politicians are much more careful about drinking, but that may mean that they're doing other things. Okay. Class A things. Maybe, oh. maybe on that, I want to leave time for Alistair to give us a skull on the pipes, as he promised. So uh, I think we can... It's only because she has said I have to. I mean. <laughs> We can call a halt uh, to the question. So first I'm going to thank Alistair, but then save your applause until after we have the tune. What would you like me to play apart from the lament? I can't end with the lament. It's a nice tune though. Uh, a happy tune, as you said, you can choose it. You mean you don't know any backpack tunes? I don't know any is that, is that Shall I take this off? <clears throat> uh, it might be a bit weird actually. Okay, just before you go and get the pipes, Alistair, um, I'm sure you'll all agree that we've had a very thoughtful and illuminating talk. It's given us a lot to think about, the lack of services, the lack of research, the stigma attached to mental health. 12 years of Tory government. <laughs> uh, and, and also our um, inability to deal with differences with people who don't conform to the norm uh, in, and less so when it's their behavior. Then we now have societies moved towards being more tolerant of physical disabilities, but not so much towards mental disabilities. Um, you probably know that people used to say that the character Malcolm Tucker in the thick of it was modeled on Alistair. 
I think we can see that that is not true. Because uh, <laughs> the big difference, Malcolm Tucker couldn't play the bagpipes. Okay. Thank you. Joyful stuff. <laughs> so thanks ever so much, Alistair. We've all really enjoyed your talk. Yes. And uh, everybody safe home. There are refreshments outside. Uh, and Alistair will be around for a little bit to answer. Any further questions? No. No. Or to, to he's going to mingle. Um.